All right, so welcome to unit five, where we'll be covering numerical methods for dynamic responses. Now keep in mind, the field of numerical methods is absolutely huge, and no doubt you will encounter numerical methods in almost any field or any course that you take. In this particular unit, we'll be looking at numerical methods through the lens of single degree of freedom dynamic responses. What this boils down to is algorithms and the best way to practice algorithms is by coding so by the end of this unit we'll be uh, tackling several of these algorithms through MATLAB this unit is going to consist of six short but intense sections we're going to start with a motivation and a general approach where we discuss the underlying structure in all these algorithms that we're going to be talking about then we're going to be talking about four algorithms, interpolation, central difference method, Newmark's method, and then Euler's and Runge-Kutta methods, all in different videos. And finally, we'll wrap up with some considerations and we'll go to MATLAB to implement some of these solutions. So in this video, let's talk about motivation and approach. At this point, you've probably asked yourself, why do we call this course Structural Dynamics and Earthquake Engineering if we haven't talked about earthquakes yet? Well, there's a good reason for that, and this is really where numerical methods show their value. Let's take a look at El Centro Earthquake and its ground motion record, which you see here at the top. You see the full record. At the bottom, you see only the first four seconds. Now, using the analytical tools that we've developed so far, it's actually quite difficult to process this type of loading. In other words, it's difficult to see how we might describe this function as an analytical function in time. What we need to observe at this function is really a discrete time function. In other words, it's defined by discrete samples in time. In other words, f is really just a set of discrete values in time. So far, we don't have a tool to deal with this. This is where numerical methods will come in very handy. Another big limitation of the tools that we've discussed so far is that they only deal with linear systems. You can imagine in the case of an earthquake, a linear system is really not that interesting because what we're really interested in is large loads, large displacements. And so here's what a typical single story moment frame might look like um, if it actually deforms plastically, right? So you may have linear deformation to a certain point, then the structure goes plastic, returns a link along a linear response curve, becomes plastic again, and so on. And so you get this hysteresis loop, right? We have no way to, to deal with that so far. And so what we'd like, again, is a way where we can actually introduce nonlinear responses um, and be able to solve for them. Okay, now let's talk about these limitations in the context of a new equation of motion. So here I've written this equation of motion, which still has the typical terms mu double dot and cu dot. But instead of the ku term, I've placed in this arbitrary function of u and u dot. And I'm calling this function f sub s because it's going to represent our spring forces. And we still have some function P of T, which represents our external loading. Okay, now, like I mentioned, the first thing to consider is that P of T is only defined for discrete values of S. What does that look like visually? Well, similar to El Centro, we would have a function which is defined as only discrete points where we call each point in time by a t with a subscript. So our first point is t0, our second point is t1, t2, all the way to an arbitrary value in time ti. This means we can describe p 
as simply a set of values p0, p1, p2, through pi, and so forth. And most importantly, the distance between time intervals is what we'll call our time interval delta t. Okay, and that'll be a very important parameter in all of our algorithms. Now, f of s is, like I mentioned, an arbitrary function, and this, going, this is going to give us the capability to model nonlinear systems. So, for a linear system, f of s would be our typical ku, right? This is for a linear case. That's not that interesting in this case. For a nonlinear system, this could be really anything. So we could model, for example, a cubic spring, in which case this would be a function ku to the third, okay? In this case, we would get a force displacement response which would look much more like this, right? So now we can articulate mathematically why the tools that we've developed so far, namely Duomo's integral, which was our most general tool, really have trouble applying to this new equation of motion. So if we take the first case where we have a discrete set of loads, and thinking back to Duomo's integral, actually, we might recall that Duomo's integral could deal with discrete loads. If you recall, we could describe the response at any point in time, we'll call this UTI in this case, as a sum of the area under a discretized load which would be our, the value of that load times the tar time interval over which we're discretizing. And before we called it d tau, in this case we might call it delta t, but I'll stick with the old notation. And we multiply that area times our impulse response function, right? Which was in terms of our time variable minus tau. And in this case we would have, sorry, this should be a t, our time variable, and that t went from 0 to ti. This gave us the ability to deal with discretized loads, but the main drawback here is that this approach is very inefficient when you think about numerical methods or numerical processes. This is because when you look at the equation, you notice that we are summing over the entire time interval every time we evaluate a new time step. What numerical methods will give us is the ability to compute the response one time step after the other using only information from the previous time step. Duomo's integral needs information all the way back to the beginning of the response, time t0. That's why it's inefficient. Okay, so great for computing analytical responses in a general way, but not super efficient numerically. So not recommendable in this case. In the second case where we have a nonlinear equation somewhere in the EOM, Duomo's integral is completely useless at this point. Remember that Duomo's integral assumes superposition of impulse responses. This requires linearity. So at this point, we're completely out of luck. And this is really where the main, main advantage of numerical methods comes in, is that they're efficient and feasible ways to compute responses of nonlinear systems. Okay, so now let's talk about how 
numerical approaches work in a general sense. Obviously, once we dig into the details of specific methods, things will get a lot more complex, but all numerical approaches can be boiled down to two basic steps. The first of those steps is to discretize the equation of motion. What does that mean? Well, it means we're moving away from continuous functions and calculus and into discrete variables and difference equations. All right, so let's look at how that looks visually. We have now a response which is only defined at specific intervals, right? So we're talking about time on the x-axis and our response u on the y-axis. And so we might have a value ui at a particular time, and then we're trying to move to the next interval, which would be ui plus 1, right? Again, let me reiterate, this is separated by a time delta t. Now, throughout this video and the subsequent videos, I will be using color coding to denote what variables are known and which ones are unknown. So in this case, let's assume that we've already solved for the response at the time ui. So I will denote this as green. And I will keep ui plus 1 as red for unknown. Okay. So at the particular time instance ui, we know that the equilibrium of the system must, must obey the equation of motion. So we can write our new equation of motion very similarly, but in a discrete form. So where we have a discrete acceleration times m, we have a discrete velocity times our damping coefficient, we have a discrete displacement times our stiffness, and all that has to balance out our force value at that particular time. Okay, so this is our discretized equations of motion. Pretty simple. The trick is figuring out how to move from the time instance i to the subsequent time instance i plus 1. And this is where step 2 comes in, where we can do one of two things, but in essence we have to make some assumption about what is going on in this interval between i and i plus 1. Okay, And I'll denote assumptions in this case by the color purple. All right, so Let's look at the first case where we can make an assumption, as in step 2a, make an assumption about the force in that time interval. So if we have, let's say, a known force pi um, and a known force pi plus 1, keep in mind that we know the force history ahead of time, so this is not pi plus 1 is always known, we can make some assumption about what is the force doing in between and we can say that for example this force can be linear on the other hand maybe we don't want to make any assumptions about the force we can instead make some assumptions about the trajectory of the system by trajectory I mean either u dot or u double dot the velocity or the acceleration what does that mean well we can look for example at our point ui. We know that. We also supposedly know the slope at that point, which is our u dot i. Well, we can assume that the trajectory over a small time interval remains constant and therefore will lead us to our unknown point ui plus 1. So we will talk about four methods in the series of videos, which you see here. And to the side is the corresponding chapter associated with each method. Chopra only covers interpolation, central difference, and Newmark. We're going to the Inman book for 
Euler and Runge Kutta methods. Now, spoiler alert, methods three and four, particularly Newmark and the Runge Kutta method, are going to be our go to for almost any kind of problem. However, interpolation and central difference are presented mostly for your benefit so you get a nice broad view of the numerical methods available. They tend to show up here and there, and so it's important to at least know some general information. But our focus is going to be, particularly in the coding, is going to be on Newmark and Runge-Kutta methods. It's worth noting at this point where some of these methods might be useful. All right, so interpolation piecewise exact is uh, a great method for linear systems. Okay, it cannot solve nonlinear systems. All the other methods can deal with nonlinearity. But the Runge Kutta method is going to be by far the most efficient method for implementing nonlinear systems, which is one of the big reasons I bring it up in this series of videos. Newmark's method is going to be quite good in most cases, uh, but particularly for solving multiple degree of freedom, which we won't cover here, but it's good to know moving forward. So the next four videos in this unit are going to cover each of these methods individually. Again, I really encourage you to focus your efforts on understanding number three, Newmark's method, and number four, Euler and Runge-Kutta methods.